Hi, everybody. Uh, I think we're going to get started now. Um, there may be a few more people who come in, but we'll get started. Um, welcome. Uh, we are here as members of various UK universities to give you a bit of information, hopefully helpful information, um, about the UK as a whole in terms of higher education and how you can help your students a bit more, the processes and the opportunities that are there for Indian and international students. We are going to try and keep this fairly informal, um, and we appreciate this is one of the last sessions, and you've been here for a day and a half, lots of people talking, showing slides, and lots of information to take in. So to try and avoid information overload, we're not going to be trying to show you too much on screen and keep it fairly informal. Um, we're also going to have a Q&A at the end, so if there's anything you want to ask about, whether it's specific to a subject or the way UCAS works or anything specifically for one of the colleagues from the universities, then there'll be lots of time at the end for Q&A, because I think that's always really useful and helpful for you guys as well to, to learn from each other um, and what, what sort of challenges you might be facing in terms of sending students to the UK or applications or understanding the process. So we will just hopefully give you a brief overview. So I'm Caroline Everett, and I'm from the Arts University in Bournemouth. So I'm based right down on the south coast, as far south as you can get to before you're in the sea. Um, I will be talking later on a little bit about uh, opportunities for students to come to the UK before starting a degree. Uh, we also have Tim, Tim Pilkington from Nottingham University. Uh, he will be giving an interesting talk on the overview of higher education in the UK. We've got Francesca Kasky from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. So we have Scotland and England represented here today, as well as Candice from the University of St Andrews in Scotland as well. And Dolan is here from King's College London, but she's based in India here. So just to give you an idea of the session overview, as I say, we will try to keep it quite brief for you. Uh, as I say, Tim will just give a bit of an overview of the system and how it works in the UK compared to perhaps the, U the US. And Francesca will be talking about what to expect. So when you're advising your students about what it's like to be in Britain, you can give them a bit more information and have an idea of what it's like as an international student in the UK. Candice will be talking about how to prepare your students, ways you can make sure they are successful. One thing we want to see is more students being successful with their applications at the UK. So hopefully we can give you some tips to make them successful. I'll be talking about, as I say, opportunities perhaps to make choices and come to the UK before you start a degree, which is often quite helpful for international students making big decisions. And then Doolan will be talking about the application process key dates, all those sorts of things, the nitty gritty that we all have to know about. Uh, and as I say, we'll open it up to Q&A at the end, so please let us know if you have any questions about any part of this process, because it'd be good to share the knowledge with you. Right. Everyone hear me? Right at the back? Okay, good. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Pilkington, and I'm what's known as an international relations officer at the University of Nottingham. So it's my job to be the main point of contact for students applying uh, pretty much straight from South Asia. Uh, I spend a lot of time in India, and indeed I think this is my 13th trip to India, so I'm getting to know the market quite well. Um, and it's lovely to see some familiar faces and um, some not so familiar faces from our American friends over here. I've been given a fairly easy job today. Um, I'm giving a, a very brief overview of the UK education system. Now, we have been doing it for nearly a thousand years. I think Oxford was 1095 or something, so we're getting for, forward to our thousand year anniversary, and I can't really condense that into a five minute slot. Um, so I'm just going I'm going to give you a brief overview of the UK in a nutshell. I hope that's an idiom that translates across uh, to the Indian market. So, in the UK, given our relative size, we're pretty good at higher education. As I say, we have been doing it for a while, and relative to our size, much like our recent Olympic successes, uh, Great Britain is punching well above its weight. Um, in terms of universities themselves, we have around 130. Now, if you expand that to further FE and HE colleges, we're talking about maybe 300 to 400 institutions who offer further education courses. Um, so it's something which is taken very seriously by ourselves. Furthermore, there's much more diversity, not in just in terms of institutions, which I'm going into a bit later, but in terms of the course profiles which we offer. Now, in the UK, we offer what's known as this early degree specialisation. So students have a very clear idea of what they want to be doing. The UK is a fine choice for them. If they want to become a doctor, let them study medicine straight up. If they want to become a lawyer, they can study law um, right from the start. But 
it expands far beyond that. And this is something which I continually try and tell our Indian students, you don't have to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. Um, so in terms of the courses that are offered in the UK, there are close to 40,000. Um, the UK's main strength comes from our history and our research outputs. A lot of the UK universities have a very strong research focus, um, including the Russell Group, which is a group I will um, attempt to decode in a little bit more detail later. Research um, tends to dictate the, um, the direction of a university and indeed the funding of a university. Um, so that's something um, which the UK is pretty famous for. We have 18 institutions in the top 100, accounting for nearly what, a fifth of, of the top universities worldwide. Um, so yes, punching above our weight. So I thought I'd give a very kind of brief overview of the UK and its relationship with India. The UK has traditionally always been a very strong market for the Indian market. This is as a result of our shared collective history. Um, the UK and India have a, have a lot of links and tie-ups. Currently, well, according to the most recent reliable data, which is the British Council data of essentially a year or two years back now, uh, there are over 18,000 students in India. The year before that, there were around 19,000. So this is a number which is marginally dropping at this moment in time as a result of a, a couple of factors, really. The one that we tend to, uh, tend to obsess over was the removal of this post-study work. So time was back in the day in the UK, I think around, well, just before 2012, students would be able to come over to the UK, um, study a master's or, or indeed a bachelor's degree course, and then they're able to stay in the UK for a couple of years um, and, and getting exposed to the labour market there um, in whatever sector they, they chose. The removal of this uh, resulted in a large dip in applications to the UK. Since then, it's been growing um, to a more steady rate. Uh, but the other issue that we have is the increasing competition. Naturally, um, and much as the focus of, 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 of this conference is the US institutions, um, have, a, have a, a large chunk of this market, but similarly Canadian institutions, Australian institutions, uh, institutions from New Zealand and also France and Germany um, are, are gaining an increasing importance um, in the market. So this is a, a growing phase of competition that we cannot be complacent in front of. Um, so there has been a small decrease in undergraduate numbers in the UK. This said, depending on who you speak with, um, the UG market in India apparently is growing. I've been speaking to a number of my educational representatives, our agents, who reliably inform me uh, that the undergraduate market is looking rosy in India as a result of the increase of IB schools, for example, in the area. Um, but this remains to be seen, and we will have a look later. So, um, in terms of what you can study in the UK, as I said before, a wide range of courses. Now, We'll probably start with foundation degrees. The foundation market in the UK is something which is actually getting quite interesting at this moment in time. Time was a number of institutions offered their own foundation courses. So foundation courses were designed effectively for students um, who, well, in the UK, who hadn't achieved the correct grades um, in order to get onto the course, but for international students who have had maybe 11 years of education where they need 12. So uh, in markets like Japan, uh, Korea, a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, they haven't had sufficient education uh, to enter the UK at bachelor's level, and that was the intention of the foundation course. Time was that universities had their own foundation courses, um, which upon successful completion uh, will directly lead um, to uh, that university's courses. What's happening more and more now is that independent foundation providers, some names which you may have heard of, like Intu and Kaplan and Study Group, will have their own foundation courses, leaving students open to a wider range of universities universities at the end of it. Now, India has never traditionally been a foundation market. We accept class 12 examinations, obviously IBs and A-levels as well. So uh, India has never been approached by us as a foundation market. This said, if students are getting results lower than ex their expected grades, um, foundation courses are open to the students. So say uh, they were taking their class 12 examinations and they were to achieve perhaps between, a, from the University of Nottingham's perspective, between a, a 75 or, or an 82. Uh, in their class 12 examinations, not sufficient um, to gain entry to our bachelor's degree course. In that instance, they will be offered a foundation course, which upon successful completion, they will be able to progress to any one of the courses. Now, a lot of UK universities are accepting each other's foundation courses, and they're accepting uh, the private provider's foundation courses, so that's a viable option for students who perhaps haven't done as well as they may have expected. Uh, the kicker, obviously, is that students are required to spend another year of study um, making well, in 
England, uh, it's to be a, a four-year degree. Of course, I've got to be very careful because we have our delegates from Scottish universities, which, of course, is a, a four-year um, degree um, in completion. Okay, so that is foundation degrees. Um, so we have single honours and joint honours. We don't offer shall we say, the more holistic view of US degrees where they are able to study liberal arts and science and pick and choose and then focus on a major and a minor. Um, students are required to focus on one specific area of study and stick to it. If they want to switch to a different area of study, they're going to have to make a new application. They're going to have to switch to another area. This said, there is a more degree of flexibility than initially students may first think. So uh, in terms of joint honours, this tends to be for courses which are very closely related to one another. another. Um, so they'll be able to study, for example, economics and a language or um, uh, maths and physics or something like that. They will be able to uh, join up two degree courses and, and make it their individual course. Um, Full-time study is only available to international students. International students at this moment in time are not allowed part-time study. Um, sandwich courses and international exchanges is something which is interesting and something which is growing in prominence in the UK. The UK has always had a very large provision for study abroad programs. Each university that you'll speak to, I believe all of the universities that are here today will have a fairly comprehensive um, catalogue of opportunities for their students to be studying abroad. At Nottingham, for example, um, we're, I wouldn't say a sector leader, but we're very advanced in, in this area. Uh, we have two international campuses, one in China and one in Malaysia. Uh, we have one of the largest Erasmus uh, schemes in the UK where students are able to study anywhere in Europe. We'll see what happens with that uh, following uh, the untangling of Brexit, which I assume you may have some questions about later. Uh, but also our agreements with US universities, Australian universities, uh, universities in East Asia, Australasia. It's, um, it's really a wide opportunity for a student to spend a semester, if not a year, abroad. Um, some of these might be credit bearing, some of them might be just for a semester of experience, but it's worthwhile for the students to be investigating those opportunities available to them as well. Similarly with sandwich courses. Now, um, uh, coming back to the post-study work element or the work experience opportunities that comes with the UK degrees, this is something which is increasing in importance, particularly in master's courses. A lot of master's courses in the UK now, or a lot of universities are now thinking towards adding a year's worth of placement alongside uh, a one-year master's course. But similarly with bachelor's degrees, a lot of degrees are now offering one year of working experience, some of it paid, some of it unpaid, um, alongside the degree um, to give added value to a student's degree. In most engineering courses, for example, offered by the University of Nottingham, we will offer a sandwich uh, year in industry. Similarly with computer science, we offer it with our accountancy degree now, and I'm sure each university um, will, be, uh, will, will have their own uh, examples which they can draw from. The interesting thing really about competition um, for cornering the India market. What I've found over the past two years anyway is that UK universities are colluding a lot more. I've worked in India now for, as I say, the past two years. Initially, I found UK universities to be very closed off, very secretive about what it is, uh, what it is that, um, that they're doing in country, about sharing data, about sharing school visits. Over the past couple of years, I think they've realized the competition is now external from our friends uh, from, from the US. And in, in the face of that, UK universities are becoming much more savvy in ways in which we can work together. Um, so I'm currently um, part of a consortium that's visiting a number of schools in Mumbai, and Dehradun, and Missouri, um, which is making it a lot easier for, for school counselors to uh, get UK universities in one fell swoop. And I think you may well be seeing more of that in the, in the, in the near future. OK, I think this is my final slide. Is everyone still with me? Is everyone still understanding my accent as well? I've had complaints before about mumbling and stuff. No? OK. Um, now, I move to my final slide here. Um, I heard a wonderful analogy yesterday at um, one of the IB talks referring to uh, counselling students um, and matching them up with a university similar to an arranged marriage in India College, finding the perfect match alongside, uh, alongside the universities. And that's absolutely true. Now, I work for the University of Nottingham. We're in a, a fairly privileged position in that our, uh, our reputation in India is very strong. Uh, we're top 100, I think we're 70th at the moment in, in the world. Um, so we, we're starting from a very strong point, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should be advising every single student. 
the great thing about our panel today is that we have such a wide range mm -hmm. of institutions, not just from England, uh, also from Scotland, Arts University, which is something that the University of Nottingham certainly doesn't offer. If I have a student coming to me asking, oh, I want to take performing arts or I want to be an artist, um, I would by no means recommend them to study um, our degree in art history or the one which is closely related to them. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, whereas if they were to study it somewhere like the Arts University of Bournemouth, which has um, a wide stream professional connections, it has the better facilities, it has the more relevant opportunities to that particular student. Um, that's what I would advise. Now, I'm sure as school counsellors, this is something which you are oh too aware of anyway, and it's about dispelling these sort of myths. So in the UK, um, all universities are under the same sort of quality assurance schemes. Um, all universities are funded pretty much in the same way, bar maybe three or four private institutions. All other UK universities have a fairly homogenized way of running. So how do you categorize the UK universities? There are loads of different ways, and each one of them doesn't make as much sense as, as the next. They're all a bit crazy. Uh, you can look at age and location. So, for example, you have the ancient universities. If you're thinking England, you have Oxford and Cambridge. If you're thinking in Scotland, I believe there's four of you guys, including St Andrews and Aberdeen. Um, so these are the universities. If your students were to want a... Uh, which is their Harry Potter experience from, uh, from their study, if they want to be living in a castle or whatever it might be, uh, that might be an option for you. Red Brick Universities, it will feature a number of decent universities, such as Newcastle, Manchester, Birmingham, um, but that's no way to categorise a particular university and certainly shouldn't be the way that a student should be making an informed decision on an institution. Similarly, Plate Glass Universities, they refer to universities usually post-1960, um, which include the University of East Anglia, the University of York, a fairly prominent university in the UK, I believe, Warwick, I could be wrong about that. Um, these are more fairly modern universities, perhaps which don't um, resonate as much with, with the Indian audience, but include some very strong universities that shouldn't be overlooked. Similarly, you have mission groups. Now, I spend a lot of my time speaking about the Russell Group with Indian students. Naturally, reputation and ranking plays a massive uh, importance in the Indian market, and students are looking for the top 20 institutions and Russell Group institutions. When they always ask for Russell, Russell Group institutions, they ask me, are you a Russell Group institution? I say, yes, and then I ask them, what does the Russell Group mean? Now, they um, look at me with that blank stare, um, give me a shrug, because they know what they think. They know that they, they, they hope it means, shall we say, the top uni UK universities, the elite UK universities, similar to the Ivy League itself, which I believe doesn't have any sort of academic origins. It's a sporting thing, right? So the Russell Group is a group of sort of self-declared research-intensive universities. Um, we were a founding member amongst a number of other um, research universities. Now, yes, it does include Oxford and Cambridge and Manchester and Nottingham and the large names that you hear. It doesn't include St Andrews, for example. Um, well, you know, a, a top 50 university maybe in the world, getting their top 60. You know, a, a fairly prominent university. Bath University, another one which is being trialled under the um, newer post-study work, uh, six-month thing at the moment, not a Russell Group University, East Anglia, Kent. Uh, Russell Group, whilst an indicator, should not be um, a reason to make a decision on the university. Similarly with ranking tables. Now, again, I don't want to be telling councillors to be slapping exit, because everyone understands that ranking systems are um, very difficult to be making a specific decision on. Um, a good example, and I hate to be calling out King's on this one, King's College London, one of the most reputable institutions in, in the UK, consistently in the top 30 in the world rankings, top 20 in the world rankings, I'm reliably informed. Um, but in the UK rankings and certain ranking systems, Guardian ranking systems, for example, they're down, what, 30 at the moment, something like, similarly, University of Nottingham, uh, I think we're 28th in the Guardian UK ranking systems, next to Falmouth University, has anyone ever heard of Falmouth? A fine institution of what it does, but not one which would immediately resonate with, with, with an audience such as the Indian audience. What I'm trying to get at is that whilst rankings can be a, an indicator, they are by no means um, the be-all and end-all. Students need to be looking far beyond that and at the course particularly. We're blessed in the UK to have these very specific courses um, so you can study um, my favourite one at the minute is viticulture and enology that you can study at the University of Brighton, wine studies, effectively. I don't think you'll be able to study that anywhere else in the world. Um, University of Nottingham, we have brewing science as an undergraduate. Sorry, both of those were alcohol-related. I don't have that on the mind. Um, so um, there's a wide range of courses that stretches far beyond the biology or the law or the engineering um, or the creative arts. So students have an opportunity to be having three, four, five years of intensive study uh, on that particular subject, and that's a wonderful opportunity if the student has a direct idea of what it is that they want to be doing. 
Um, so I think that's everything that I have to say today. Thank you ever so much for listening, um, and I look forward to answering some of your questions later. Thank you. My name's Francesca. I'm from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and your minds are going to have to switch a little bit because my accent is very different from Tim's. I have a Scottish accent. Can you all understand it? Yeah, yeah? okay, great. Well, I wanted to share with you uh, a book that I have just started reading by an Indian author. Um, his name is Dr. Raghu Nathan. Is, was, did I say that? Okay, okay right, almost right. Um, and he's written this book all about cues and cue jumping and how Indians look at cues compared to other cultures. Um, and for this talk, I just wanted to look at how he compares the Indian attitude to cueing and jumping cues to the British attitude. So I just have to put my glasses on, if you'll bear with me. Okay, he says that British cues are, and I agree with him, lifeless, boring, and linear assortments of people standing somberly as if struck by life's most extreme tragedy. <laughs> that is true. Whereas in India, and this is also I agree with, our average cues are full of verve and vitality, each brain in overdrive, actively evaluating all strategies to jump the cue. <laughs> yeah? Okay, so please tell your students not to do that in the UK because if there's one big cultural difference and a big cultural no-no in, in the UK is cues, please don't jump them. Okay. Some things about being British. Now, I don't know if you can read this about at the back, so I'll just read it out for you. Being British is about driving a German car to an Irish pub for a Belgian beer, then traveling home, grabbing an Indian curry or a Turkish kebab on the way, to sit on Swedish furniture, that's Ikea, and watch American shows on a Japanese TV. That has, I couldn't find anything to, to, to explain to me what being British is. And that's possibly because, apart from this, there really isn't anything that, um, that makes a person British. In fact, as you know, there are four, four groups of us there. There's about 60 million people altogether, and most of them do live in England. About 50 million live in England. In Scotland, there are 5 million people. Now, we're more or less the same size geographically, but there's only 5 million in Scotland. In Wales, there are about 3, and in Northern Ireland, there are about 2. 7 million people live in the capital of the UK, which is London. Now, we all speak this language called English, but only people from England are, their nationality is being English. So please tell your students, if they're talking to somebody from Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland, don't say that they're English because they don't like that. Only people from England are happy to be called English, okay? So that is two of the, of the big don'ts, don't do this. Some of the differences that, that students will find between studying in India and studying in the UK, I wanted to divide that into the differences they would find in an institution and just wandering around a city. Let's start with the institution. In the UK, there is much less formality at university. Students are often invited to call their teachers, their professors, by their first names. And during lectures, they are invited and expected to ask questions, possibly even to argue in a polite way, or to ask the lecturer to, to back up what it is they're saying. They're not expected just to sit and absorb what is being told to them. And, and this is sometimes a bit of a culture shock for any Asian students who come over to the UK. They, they eventually get used to it, but it's, it's wise to tell them beforehand, please, when you're over there, talk, argue, discuss, because that will be expected of you. Just going back to cues again, um, just a few, a few weeks ago at my university in Aberdeen, I was standing in a queue waiting to buy a coffee and some crisps, and the two people in front of me was the vice chancellor. So the informality extends to the vice chancellor, who we call Ian, because that's his name, and who, if he wants a packet of crisps, he has to come and he stands in a queue with everybody else. There is no expectation that anybody at the university will get to the front of the queue. Now, our chancellor is Camilla, Prince Charles's wife. Maybe she would get to the start of the queue. I don't know. I don't know. It's never been tested. Um, 
Despite the fact, though, that the, there's this informality, there is, it's a respectful informality. Out in the city, I was speaking to an Indian student just recently, and he said, I went into my hotel to get ready for dinner. I came out, and suddenly there was nobody there. It was like the city had been evacuated. Something that happens in the UK is that the shops tend to close earlier, maybe five, half past five. And when that happens, in most places, everybody just goes home. So there isn't the, the vitality and the people walking the street that you get in cities here in India. So tell your students, don't be worried if suddenly there's nobody there. It's just that they've all gone home. In some places, when the cinemas open and the dancing open and the restaurants open, you get a little bit of life again. But no, nothing, nothing like you find here. It's, it's brilliant here. We drive on the left. So that's something we've got in common. So Indian students won't get knocked over by looking the wrong way when they cross the road, which is good. And they also won't get knocked over because when we want to cross a road, we press the button, eventually all the lights go to red and all the traffic stops completely and you can just cross. So they will be very, very safe on the streets of the UK. The weather, okay? We, can, we have to mention the weather and all I want to say is it's true. We can have four seasons in one day. The advice to give your students is don't be worried. It doesn't ever get so cold that you're going to freeze and you'll certainly never melt in the UK. Bring clothes and dress in layers. So if it gets a bit warmer, you can take a cardigan off. If it suddenly starts to rain despite the fact that the sky has been blue all morning, you can put on a, a light jacket and carry an umbrella. Unfortunately, if you come to Scotland, we don't have nice heavy rain normally the way you had in Delhi last week. In Delhi, with an umbrella, you are protected from the rain. In Scotland, the rain, and I don't know about other parts of the UK, but in Scotland, the rain sometimes comes horizontally. <laughs> that happened on my wedding day, that's why I remember. So an umbrella isn't always the best thing to have. But dress in layers, that's, that's what to tell them. I wanted to say a little bit about accommodation. Um, at Aberdeen, we're a campus-based university, and we encourage our international students to come to university accommodation because we, we offer it, at least in their first year. It makes them feel safer. I think the parents are happier, and it also gives them a chance to um, meet other international students. Of course, another way that they can meet students before they arrive is through Facebook groups, and often accommodation people have their own Facebook group, and so they get to meet who are going to be their neighbours before they come over. There are other Facebook groups too, of course, depending on the subject you're going to or the country you're coming from. But it's, it's just another way to help them settle in when they get there. Um, as Tim said, there are a whole load of different kinds of institutions. Um, some ha offer catered or self-catering options for accommodation. My son chose to go catered and he put on two stones, um, so that um, and there's also the option of having ensuite facilities or shared facilities. Again, back to my son. He wanted ensuite. He didn't get his first choice. He had to share bathroom facilities. And then he realised what a lucky escape he had had. Because if you share facilities, somebody from the university comes and cleans them every day. If you have your own ensuite, you have to clean it yourself. And on that note, thank you very much for listening. Hello again. So I'm going to talk very briefly um, about an area I hope will be of interest to some of you. Uh, I deal mostly with students from a fairly young age. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm finding these days, particularly with Indian and international students, they are very focused, uh, which is lovely to see, and they are thinking earlier and earlier about their choices and what options are out there for them. And I know as advisors and counsellors, you also have to do the same, and you're starting to counsel your students younger, uh, and they have their career aspirations in place earlier. Uh, and some students I, say, I speak to might be 12 or 13 saying, I know what I want to do, I'm going to be an animator, or I'm going to be a historian, and I know the exact route I'm going to take. That's great, and I love it when I hear that passion and enthusiasm. But sometimes, that theoretical idea of what it's going to be like isn't the reality. And what we don't want to see is students applying for courses and degrees in the UK, having an idea of what they think it's going to be like, coming to the university and being totally different, and either dropping out or not doing very well. 
you know, you'll be coming a long way. It's a big expense. It's a big commitment for families as well. And so we want them to get the best education and have the best experience whilst they're with us. So a lot of UK universities uh, offer summer courses and shorter courses. So I'm going to talk very briefly about that for any of you who may not be aware of that option and also how it's very attractive almost as a try before you buy approach. So the transition from school to university. I often talk to lots of teachers and advisors who say, Caroline, how can we make that jump up to university? We know what universities are looking for. We know that they're always talking about independent learning, critical thinking, uh, creative problem solving. And obviously, I'm from an arts university, but these, I would say, apply to all of the universities. It's not just about grades anymore, as the colleagues have touched upon. This is the importance of personal statement, extracurricular, and where you're going in life. So I would say a lot of these qualities would apply to every university. They're not just looking for the stats and the grades. They want to see students who have a unique voice, have the social awareness that I'm so pleased to see has been such a big part of this conference recently. Uh, Cross-discipline awareness, that understanding of that it's not in a box, it's not a separate subject, how it works in the world, how it works in industry, how they collaborate with other universities, how they collaborate on different courses, how it all connects in the real world. And that's really important. So I'm often asked, how do we get our students from the school to university with all of these already in place so they can hit the ground running and be successful? Now, as Tim touched upon, many universities have foundation courses. Now, these are really ideal for students uh, who want to have a shorter period of time to study. They may not have what they need to start an uh, uh, undergraduate course. So if you're an international student finishing high school exams and you've completed, say, less than 13 years, then you would need to take a foundation to come and do the undergraduate degree in a, a UK university or college. Um, it is a very attractive option for students, regardless of whether it's arts-based or perhaps more traditionally based. As I say, they have that academic support and guidance. Uh, they get a real understanding of what it's like and where they're going to go, go next and whether the subject they thought they were going to do is actually what, in reality, it is like. Uh, and they also have the chance of completing a successful application better. Once they've been at that university, you're immersed in British culture, you're immersed in British life and the way of working. They are much more confident, have much more support. So when they want to then apply for the undergraduate degree, many universities will either offer a progression straight on to the undergraduate degree, or those that don't will, will see it as a massive benefit that students have this foundation experience under their belts and understand how it works in the UK for universities. So it's always something to think about if you have students who think they want to apply to the UK, but they might not be there in terms of level, a foundation is always worth asking the university about what they offer and how it works. Now, something that I'm heavily involved in, in in my job at the Arts University Bournemouth is summer courses, um, and many universities offer these in, in America and the UK. So what is the benefits of a summer course? As I've said, a lot of students want to have the try before you buy. It's a massive decision, I understand, signing up for a, a degree program, especially if you might be a first-generation Indian student coming to a UK university. It's, it's a huge commitment, and it's very difficult to understand without really being there what it's like. So they can get really good experience of a British university and immerse themselves in it. Lots of skills and techniques, and most importantly, it does enhance their university application. Lots of students I deal with haven't made their mind up even about the university they want to go to, and they may come to my university for a summer course, but they might just be considering lots of different universities. But by being there, having that experience, putting it in their application, it just gives them that step up, and also that real experience of what it's actually like and whether it's going to suit them or not, which is great. They also get to experiment with different disciplines. So lots of summer courses are arranged in a way that they can trial different subjects. So they might be thinking they're interested in information technology, and they can look at that from a business side and maybe from a practical side. There may be students looking at history and civilization, and they can also do study trips to get real context to what they're talking about and really base it on real life briefs. As I say, they, could, they can also boost their career prospects. They have real life experience in this country looking at real projects, real industry. And that's great for their application. And also to inform them of where these subjects can go, either in the UK or internationally. As I say, 
And Francesca was brilliant at talking about British culture or what we think of as British culture. But uh, again, with student accommodation, I think it's always really useful for younger students and internationals to experience it beforehand because it's a big leap. So a summer course is often between one and four weeks long in the summer, obviously, in the British summertime. And a lot of the accommodation is either on site or universities have great campuses in the town. So this is a really good chance for your students, especially those who may not have traveled before without their families, to understand what it's generally like to live with other students, experience different cultures as well as British cultures, and get themselves immersed in that so that when they come here, if they choose to come to UK, they can hit the ground running. English. Now, I haven't come across any Indian students so far who haven't impressed me with their English. However, at a university level, it's really important that they can feel confident in how they're communicating with their, with their peers and their tutors. And it's a great way with a shorter course that they can step that up again just a little bit so they feel confident with the terminology and the academic setting. Sharing ideas and skills with students from around the world, I think, is uh, really important. And I think more than ever now, the younger generation of students coming through, they want to be globally mobile, and they understand that the world is internationally, and we can no longer just look at small borders, and we all have to work together. Collaboration happens all over the world, and we will all have to work with each other in some respect. So by sharing and collaborating, which is what a lot of UK universities are about, they get that experience and that understanding earlier of how it works. Now, specifically for my, for my university, the Arts University Bournemouth, you can develop a portfolio. So during a summer course, for those students who might be thinking about art and design, performance, media, it's a great chance for them to get their application and their portfolio ready to the best it can be so that they can then apply to university and they have everything they need. So it's really valuable for, for young students, I would say usually from about 13 um, till 16, 17, for them to consider a summer course but gives so many opportunities for them to get more knowledge about it and, and, and what it offers. If you'd like more information about that, do, do contact me later but, um, or any questions you have about how it works for summer courses would be great to answer later on. Hi, my name is Dolan and I'm the International Officer from King's College London. Well, uh, my slide is not working. Yes, it is. Okay, so I'll uh, very briefly talk about uh, UCAS applications. Um, well, if you have to apply to an undergrad course in the UK, you have to apply through the UCAS, the Universities and College Admissions Services. Now, it's a central body which administers uh, university applications in the UK. Now, this is an entirely uh, online system which can be tracked uh, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. Now, there are six sections in the UCAS application form. There's the personal information, where, of course, you, talk, you write, write down your name, your address, and so on. Uh, then comes the course choice options. Well, you could choose one or more than one, up to five choices. It doesn't have to be uh, five universities. It could be five choices in one university or more than one. Um, then comes the education information. Well, uh, you have to put in uh, your 10th grade uh, subjects and marks. And the 12th grade subjects, of course, you wouldn't have the marks by then. Uh, if you have any uh, work experience, you have to write down in the employment information. Then comes the personal statement. I think Candice will talk a little more about personal statement. Uh, this is a very important uh, part of the application. Uh, and uh, well. Uh, it's about 4,000 characters with spaces. Then comes the reference, sorry, the reference. Well, again, uh, a very important tool for the admissions to assess the student. So this would also include the predicted grade. Now, the reference, of course, has to be filled in by the counselor, the teacher, or the principal, whoever could assess the student best. Yes, it's uh, five choices and one personal statement. So, um, well, Candice will explain that better. So I'll just go on to my next slide. Well, certain important dates. Well, applications open from the 6th of September. You can fill in your application, but you cannot submit it before the 6th. And uh, you have a lot of time to, to put in the application. Uh, apart from medicine and dental courses, which has an early deadline of 15th of October. And for most Oxbridge courses, it's 15th of October. Um, 
Now, the deadline for majority of the other university courses, it's usually 15th of January. And for the art and design courses, it is 24th of March. Now, for international students, um, you can apply beyond the state if the courses are still open. Now, the standard deadline to accept your uh, conditional offer is first week of May. Uh, and once you get the conditional offer, you have to, of course, check the details of the offer. Uh, there could be a requirement for an English exam. Uh, there could be a requirement for further documentation. Um, so it's uh, good to keep a check on the messages that you get on the application portal. Now, when you apply through the UCAS, you cannot send any documentation. You cannot attach any documentation. So once um, the universities uh, receive the application, they will send the student the login details of uh, the individual of that particular university uh, to the student. And then the student can actually uh, send documentation um, um, through the portal or via email. Yes, and some uh, courses may require interviews, so it's always uh, good to keep a check on the messages that come in. Well, where tuition fees are concerned, it ranges, uh, it has a very wide range. It depends on the university, it depends on the course. So it ranges uh, between 10,000 pounds to about 25,000 pounds a year. Uh, and uh, the dental and uh, the dentistry and the medicine courses, uh, the clinical years will cost even higher. It can go up to 37,000 pounds or so for a couple of years. Where scholarships and funding is concerned, uh, well, at the undergrad level, usually not a huge amount of scholarships are offered. Uh, the, it, again, it would range, say, roughly 1,000 pounds to 5,000 pounds, but of course it depends on uh, the different university schemes. Now the university scholarships uh, uh, could be country-based, it could be just for Indian students, it could be subject-based, it could be just for particular subjects, uh, and usually it's entirely merit-based. Okay, Brexit. <laughs> well, do you have any questions on Brexit? But I'm sure you do. But before you ask me, maybe I'll just uh, tell you a few things. Well, Brexit was really about um, the lives, the people living in the UK. And it, it wasn't really about the students. The UK has always and will always continue to uh, welcome Indian students and international students, for that matter. Now, uh, you know, the policy changes are not likely to be felt uh, before two or three years because, and it's very difficult for us to really say exactly, you know, what will happen because, um, you know, the negotiations between the UK and the EU have barely begun. Now, what we can assume a bit is that um, European students will probably uh, be a little more affected than the other international students because maybe they're, uh, their fees will increase, and they would require a visa to stay, uh, to come and study in the UK. Now, for an Indian student who is about to commence their uh, studies in the, in the UK universities, their fees will suddenly not be hiked or anything. Of course, there's uh, the usual annual slight inflationary increase that happens every year. Um, apart from that, there will there's not likely to be any change whatsoever. Um, Yes. Where career opportunities are concerned, uh, well, um, you know, London is most likely to remain uh, the, you know, Europe's leading or the world's leading international financial center. And post Brexit, we have not uh, seen you know, companies going off, uh, leaving UK because probably relocating elsewhere is even more expensive. Uh, they're all there. The, the stock market has recovered. Uh, the sterling um, has come down a bit and much to the advantage of our Indian students. Uh, and some say the sterling was actually quite high for a long time. And now it's probably at the right level. Uh, uh, where Indian students are concerned, they've even taken, uh, they've taken advantage of 
the, the lower uh, rates and they've actually paid off their entire year's fees. And the undergrad students, at least at King's, uh, King's College London, um, have actually paid off their three-year fees so to take advantage of this. Uh, another thing that um, may be an advantage to uh, Indian students is that there could be a skill shortage in UK and uh, the, universe, the government may be looking for uh, skilled university students and employers may be more willing and more open to recruiting uh, more international students. Another thing that may happen is that the UK institutions will uh, most likely increase collaborations with non-EU uh, institutions. So it's not all gloom and doom. Great. Um, yeah, that's about it. So um, there are some links where you can find more information. And of course, we are here if you would like to ask some questions. Candice? You just to complicate or uh, confuse things further, I'm the fourth, third different accent, fourth different accent for the group. Um, I, I, I won't talk about, uh, Dolan's talked a good about how the application works, and a lot of you already know how UCAS works. You've been using it, sending in your references and things like that for students. So it's how we're looking at it on our side when it comes in. And it really boils down to four parts. It's the qualifications, it's the statement, it's the LORs, and then it's the everything else. It's the contextuals. Um, it's their co-curriculars, their extracurriculars, things that they excelled at. It may also be context. Did they change schools? Did they have a difficult year? Did their parents split? That kind of thing. Uh, the personal statement, what we try to tell students is let that be as academic as possible. They're obviously going to have one application that can go to at least up to five different institutions who may call degrees different. So you don't want to say, I want to study management, another university calls it business studies. Or you're applying to management to us, but you're going to apply to art history at another university. So you have to try to, what we advise students is try to find the theme. What is it about the academics? Hopefully it's not that varied between management and art history. But what it is it themes, what it is it about the academic study that's drawing them, that's attracting them, and will then hopefully uh, be able to apply across all the programs that they're applying to, but be general enough that it's, it's not going to rule one university out. Because we do get university applications that say, I want to study at Nottingham, but we're not Nottingham. And so that can be something like that could, will impact the application review. Um, and I think that the other, the other part is the co-curriculars. We want to know that because it tells us how the students manage their time. We, we don't give points necessarily or things like that to, to co-curriculars, but we want to know the context. And I think every university is going to assess applications slightly differently. They have different teams and people like that that do it. Um, but we're all looking to try to get that, get it on paper or on the UCAS application who that person is um, to see if they're going to be the right fit, to make sure they're going to be set up to succeed when they come to university. I think we only have about 15 minutes left, so I'll go ahead and, and end it with that. We can talk more if you want to ask questions, and we'll go ahead and open it up to you and I. About any part of applying to the UK or, or what it's like, any questions? It can be subject specific, generic. Anything at all? Everyone's understood everything they've been told, have they? <laughs> it's all been noted down, is it? Yes, ab absolutely. I mean, this may well be something which changes from university to university in terms of their... Do you want to repeat the question, uh, Tim, oh, just so sorry. everybody can hear? Can, you, can everyone hear? Okay, the question was, do UK universities look at the predicted grades in order to make a decision? Effectively, yes, that's what we do at Nottingham. Anyway, um, Admissions, whilst we have a common application system making everything much easier, where it comes on, on the other side of things, the way that the universities look at the applications um, could be completely different. So some universities might put more importance, for example, on the personal statement. Some might put more importance on the grades. Um, if you're looking at medicine or law, they might be on the additional admissions tests or on the interview. But yeah, from the Nottingham's perspective anyway, it's the predicted grades upon which we make a decision. Um, now, unless there's an extreme fluctuation between between those, um, we continue to trust the schools um, to, to be making those predicted grades effectively, yes. Uh, many times we can also take combined qualifications. So if they're, um, again, it'll, it'll be by university, but if they're, if they're also looking at US schools, so they've taken the SAT or the ACT or things like that, maybe they've taken some AP courses. We were at a school yesterday that even though they're, they're ISC, they also offer AP courses that students can take. So we can take a mix of all of those. Um, and sometimes it can make the difference between a conditional and an unconditional offer depending on the university as well. So there's, the students don't have to think, I'm doing CBSEs, I can only send them CBSE 
that we can actually take so we can take everything and have a whole a whole look at what they've done and just to add if you have any students spe specifically for art design media performance um, it's much more portfolio based and that's quite different from universities that really need um, to look at those predicted grades. Of course, we look at predicted grades, um, but from an arts perspective, whether you're doing animation, fashion, architecture, graphic design, acting, they will want to see your portfolio because from an art and design perspective, there's no box ticking exercises and it's about that individual creativity. And so what they want to see is a portfolio of ideas and where that student's going and what journey they're on and where they, they want to take that so I've dealt with students in the past who haven't quite made the grades, but they've had amazing portfolios. And when I say an amazing portfolio, I don't mean finished work. It's just being able to see that spark of interest, that different idea. Maybe it's about social change and they have a great project. So uh, in the same way, I could also have a student with incredible grades. If they want to come and study animation or visual communication, if they don't have a very good portfolio and their ideas aren't very good, and I can see they don't have much of an individual style, the grades will not get them into an art and design university in, in the UK. So there's a little bit of difference there. Any other questions? At the back there. It's the first time I think came across the term foundation degree. Is it a degree per se? Or because I have always heard foundation courses. I suppose the qualifications actually would be a foundation certificate. Certificate, yeah, that's what I think. I was actually. It can be a bit confusing, I think, can't it? And they call them different things in different universities just to make it doubly hard for you doing your jobs to decide what, what is what. But I think a lot of them call them courses or, or programs, really, don't they? <laughs> yeah, we don't like to confuse at all. But I, I, normally they will refer to it as a course or a program. Um, it's, and it's you know, the stepping stone up to that undergraduate level. Well, I'm not sure about uh, the LSE thing where, where King's is concerned, uh, we accept uh, CBIC, we accept national boards, we accept state boards, we of course accept international boards, but it could be a typical LSE thing which... Did you have a question? Yes. yes. I have a question, and uh, I don't know whether it's politically correct to ask. That's you. okay, that's okay. Yes, so we yes, ask. we're all friends here now, it's fine. Is it uh, other design evaluation processes for UK become tougher for Indian students? No. Do you mean in terms of Brexit and how that's going to affect uh, it, or in general? Uh, this, this, I have been hearing it in the city that I come from uh, since before Brexit. Mm -hmm. No, the, well, not really. I mean, uh, the visa rules are not particularly tougher or easier for Indian students. You, it's a very clear-cut, simple process. You have to have the right documentation, uh, you know, to follow, you know, follow the procedure, and, and that's it. Uh, yeah, it's 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 actually become more and more clearer with mm. every passing year. So there are specific documents that you need, specific amount of money that you need to show, how to show it, uh, you know, the period of time that th that needs to be in the bank account. Everything is absolutely crystal clear. Mm. One so, thing I was going to sorry, I, one thing I was going to say about the visa side, talking to to some of you here at the conference, some of you expressed concern about students coming to study for a degree or a foundation course, um, and any restrictions on getting employment afterwards and staying after they finish their degree to get a job. Because obviously the whole point of coming to do a degree, apart from discovering yourself and being inspired, is you need to be employed, you want to be employable afterwards. And we can appreciate there are always lots of restrictions and they always like to change them once you've just understood what's going on. Um, but one thing I would say is, although that's always something we all have to work with and try to find ways around that, I think more and more, particularly I find with UK universities, the old approach has gone. The old approach of you come and do your degree, and at the end of your degree, you then start looking for a job. That has gone. And as my colleagues have been talking about, UK universities are really involved in collaboration 
with other universities, but with industry. And that is massive, regardless if you're an arts university or a more traditional university. The links are huge. And that's quite a, a change, I think, in, in how education is seen. Because what we're trying to do is get everybody prepared before they leave their course. They have that network of contacts. They have experience with work placements, internships, uh, working on industry briefs. That's something that we do a lot in UK universities. They are not pretend projects. Quite often they are working with real life companies. So the idea is we're trying to work with the system and see how we can make sure students have the best chance to get a job at the end of their studies. And so usually we try to engage them as much as possible during their degree with industry, with employment, so that when they finish that degree, either they already have a job or an internship or they can hit the ground running and they haven't got to worry about starting afresh and then returning to their home country to look for a job, which is harder to do when you're not there. So we're all trying to do that and prepare them whilst they're at uni to give them the best links so they can have that, that employment success afterwards. So at the moment, as Dolan says, I don't see any huge issues with that, and certainly not with India. Uh, and as, as we've talked about, I think the Brexit will more affect the Europeans, and I think actually there probably would be more benefits for Indian students once the negotiations happen. I think they will probably relax some of the rules. But unfortunately, we can't make the decisions, and so uh, we have to wait and see. But I, I, I can't see it being negative for Indian students particularly. For applying, yeah. Jolyn, do you want to? Oh, did you want to take the? <laughs> Bring back your. Sorry. Uh, see, my question is related to different intake uh, seasons that you have, right? Mm -hmm. Fall, autumn, uh, what do you call autumn and uh, spring, right? So, is there any particular uh, advantage that an Indian students can get? Because normally it is believed that if uh, a student is going to apply uh, for, say, January intake, normally the local students are not going to apply in huge numbers. Uh, is it a myth or is it a reality? Well, <laughs> I just wanted to know. Just to reference the question with regards to that particular Yes. A few, we don't. I think you're right. The majority is September entry. Um, everybody, do you, is it mostly for you? Do you have January starts, Candice? No. Candice? Don't have January, but no. I know that not all subjects are offered no. by our universities that we have a January date. The, the more popular ones probably have two intakes. Uh, but the majority of universities okay. will have only September intake. I would say probably 90. 8% probably are looking at, at, at September. I think, and, I think sometimes... Yeah. Um, and there is no particular advantage. No. Uh, yeah, it doesn't depend on the semester that you apply for. I think there's... Um, uh, yeah. Because you, you're not competing with them. So that's another way to put it. We're not looking at Scottish applications with Indian applications. So I, I'm going to speak from a Scottish perspective, sorry. Because we have three fee, fee statuses in Scotland. So the Scottish applications we assess... It not, has nothing to do with any of the international applications we assess. So it doesn't matter when they apply because they're not, we have fixed numbers we can take in for Scotland and so it has no impact on the international students. So it doesn't matter. And we also only have the one it takes. And I think generally with, with most universities that offer um, study abroad, which is something that, that Tim touched on, which study abroad is for students who are already at a university and they want to come and study somewhere else for a semester, which I think is the, the term that's usually used. Um, they, those can have January starts. So if you're doing study abroad, so if you were a, a, at an American university and you wanted to come and study for a shorter period of time at a UK university, um, which is a great experience, again, um, to get that idea, you know, get a dual experience of different, different universities in different countries, they can have January start dates. I think some of them have spring start dates. They're very different, but I think, yes, mostly it's September. But as Candy says, there's no competition in that. There's, there's no disadvantage. Any other questions? Right, I think we've pretty much wrapped up. Oh, one more? Hi. I think this uh, gentleman has a mic. I'm from an American university. I'll often tell students um, internationally that mm -hmm. it would 
perhaps be an advantage to go to medical school if they are considering going elsewhere to go to the UK, but I am wondering what is the actual admit rate of international students in the UK? Effectively, universities have a limited intake in, term of, in terms of the international students which they can take. I believe it's 7.5% of their intake can be international. That's correct, yeah. So at Nottingham, we've got 240 places for our medicine course, uh, 20 of which can be given to international students, uh, something, something like that. And each university will have between 10 to 20 places for international students. So it is very competitive for international students. Yes, because within five years you're you're essentially a doctor. You've got your you've got your two. Uh, aside from Scotland, in the, from <laughs> England, <laughs> sorry, uh, in England you do your five years BM, BMBS degree or, or whatever the title mm -hmm. that you give it. And yes, essentially you, you're working within the NHS. So the advantage of coming to study in the UK is that the opportunities for work experience, aside from any other course, uh, medicine, uh, you will be eff effectively um, guaranteed uh, a place. Um, to, to work in the UK just because you've done five years of work with the National Health Service, all of your placements have been with said service, but yes, incredibly competitive and okay. expensive for international students. Yeah. The, the other side that's complicated is not all countries rec recognize the degree. So in the US, they don't. In the US, you have to come back and at least take a one-year course, if not do further study. So it depends on where they want to go and what they want to do afterwards. Okay. with that medical degree. Okay. If they want to come back to India, it's recognized. If they want to go to Malaysia, it's recognized as examples. Um, if they want to stay in the UK, obviously, it's recognized. But depending on where they want to go, that's the other thing they've got to think through. So. Recently, um, with um, the way that our National Health Service has been going, there's been a bit of an exodus of junior doctors um, going to other countries. My twin sister's actually a, a doctor. Uh, she's just moved to Australia um, with her UK degree um, just because the conditions in Australia are a lot nicer, the pay's a lot better, and there's sunshine as well. <laughs> um, so uh, th that may well be happening as well, yeah. <laughs> No, I just wanted to add from the uh, admissions or applications perspective that apart from the pred predicted scores, um, we also look at the UK CAT for medicine and dentistry. Uh, now, the UK CAT is an extremely important exam for us. Uh, the interviews are usually uh, dependent on the score in the UK CAT. And for law, we also have uh, an additional exam that the students need to take, which is the LNAT. Uh, so uh, addition, these are the additional exams that may be required. And yes, we also have around 20 odd seats uh, for international students for medicine, but fiercely competitive. Mm. Uh, but yes, we do. Any other questions at all? I think we will wrap up there in that case. Um, we will be loitering suspiciously, so if anybody wants to come and ask any specific questions or, or, or talk more about, about anything we've talked about or anything we haven't covered, please, please come and talk to us, um, and we'll hopefully see you at the, the high school fair later on. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you.